Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, make sure you are subscribed, otherwise I will punch you in the throat and let's just jump into it. We had a smattering of OnlyFans news today, which makes sense, it's hugely popular and there is a fuck ton of money involved. Specifically regarding money, we saw one of their biggest creators on the platform, Amaranth, saying her account got hacked and someone actually tried to steal $900,000 that was just sitting in her account. Though, luckily for her, OnlyFans wasn't able to verify the bank account info those hackers used. And while a lot of the reaction was like, close one, that sucked, you had people saying, why do you just have $900,000 in an account? To which she actually answered saying you can only withdraw at a certain frequency or volume. So saying she does a special withdrawal with them each quarter. Side note, I think that I should no longer cover the news and instead I'm just going to manage OnlyFans models. Is that a career? Can I do that? Because anytime we talk about OnlyFans, I'm like, I'm in the wrong business. I'm going to start a whole new Friday show, OnlyFans Fridays. It's going to interview OnlyFans models or have them talk about current events and promote them and take a percentage. Did I just accidentally come up with a great idea? Like, could you imagine getting a percentage of what Belle Delphine brings in every month? Also, yes, I did just mention her so I could use her in the thumbnail. It was a week thumbnail story day. Secondly, do you remember where I recently talked about an OnlyFans creator being jailed in Myanmar? Or they said it was about the adult content, though it really seemed like it was because she criticized the government. Well, it happened again, except this time in Singapore, and it also doesn't seem to be kind of a scapegoat situation. With the production and distribution of porn being illegal in Singapore, but as Vice notes, OnlyFans creators have towed a fine line there, operating in a hidden scene that had escaped sanctions from authorities. But then, in a crackdown last year, police issued a warning to creator Titus Lowe, ordering him to stop posting to the site, but then he didn't do that, with his lawyer saying that Lowe felt an obligation to continue providing content to his subscribers, some of whom prepaid for it despite the ban. So police charged him with transmitting obscene material electronically, he pled guilty, he had to pay a $2,100 fine, and he got sentenced to three weeks in jail. But then finally, the, the legal trouble wasn't just in Singapore, rather we got updates to the lawsuit against Meta and OnlyFans. Right earlier this year, adult content creators accused Meta executives of accepting bribes from OnlyFans to get competitors blacklisted, right, and doing this by flagging competitors' content for security threats. And now, the names of three of those executives were accidentally revealed per a report from Gizmodo, with those executives including Nick Clegg, Meta's Vice President of Global Policy, Nicola Mendelssohn, Vice President of the Global Business Team, as well as another employee named Christian Perella, who LinkedIn identifies as a Facebook Trust and Safety Director. And as for how those names got leaked, OnlyFans' parent company said that it accidentally unredacted them in a filing and had asked for the document to be deleted, right, with the other filings having referred to them as John Doe's. Now, for their part, uh, Meta has denied the allegations, as has OnlyFans, but it is an ongoing case. We're going to have to see what happens because this is also not the only lawsuit of its kind at play right now. There's also this separate lawsuit from OnlyFans rival Fan Central with very similar allegations. And then I want to tell you about this amazing, brave badass that you've maybe never heard about, though some of you definitely have. His name was Takahashi Kazuki. He's the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh! And unfortunately, I have to use the past tense because he mysteriously drowned back in July. But this week, we got new revelations and they are as amazing as they are heartbreaking. It was revealed during an interview that he died while saving people from a dangerous riptide. So on July 4th, a U.S. Army major was teaching a diving class on the beach where Takahashi was visiting. The major heard a woman cry out for help because her daughter and another U.S. officer were caught in the riptide, so he and Takahashi jumped into the water, with ultimately both people saved as well as the mother who was swept out before making it back to shore. But several people said that they saw Takahashi struggle against the six-foot waves and ultimately disappear beneath them, with his body being found two days later by the Japanese Coast Guard. And in his interview, the major praised Takahashi for his actions, saying he's a hero. He died trying to save someone else. And since this revelation, many of the manga artist fans have been saying the same, saying he'll mostly be remembered for his influence on an entire generation of kids, but he should definitely be remembered as a goddamn hero. And while there's nothing that can bring us back because we all are headed to the same place, I really do believe what we do, what we try to do, the stories that we create to, to connect to other people and the stories that are told about us, those live past us. Those shape the world. And even with heartbreaking reminders like this, I think it reminds us to, to try to live a life Life and do things uh, to make a, your life a story worth telling. And then, <sighs> let's talk about Alex Jones. <laughs> A jury ordered Jones yesterday to pay eight victims' families and one first responder a whopping $965 million. That, the result of the second Sandy Hook defamation trial, and if you add on the $49 million that he was made to pay two families after the first trial, we're talking over a billion dollars of damages so far. And so we saw the victims' families finally letting out a sigh of relief in the courtroom after a decade of conspiracy-driven harassment and threats. Some seen crying or hugging their attorneys who helped them get to this moment, as well as Robbie Parker, a father who lost his daughter Emily during the shooting and whom Jones called a crisis actor saying he has a message for Jones's followers. For anybody that still chooses to listen to that man, just ask yourself, what has he ever given you? 
and compare that to whatever it is that he's taken from you. But also, let me be clear about a key thing here. This is not the end of Jones's punishments. This verdict is for compensatory damages, and the judge is still yet to determine punitive damages, including first, whether Jones has to pay any, and if so, how much, which remains uncertain. Though Connecticut law caps punitive damages at attorney's fees and litigation costs, so it's unlikely there's another billion dollar bomb coming down the pipes. You've also got another victim's family bringing Jones to a third trial down in Texas later this year. But another key takeaway is that even with the damages dished out so far, nobody's sure really how much of them Jones can actually afford to pay. But if you ask Jones himself, he'll say it's impossible, pointing to his business filing for bankruptcy recently, though that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually bankrupt. And even during his show where he actually reacted to a live stream of the verdict, he laughed and asked, they actually believe they're getting this money. It's like they believe all their own stuff. Calling the plaintiffs ambulance chasers and mocking the verdict like it was something out of Oprah. 57 million, 20 million, 50 million, 80 million, 100 million, blah, blah. You get a million, you get 100 million, you get a 50 million. And hey, it is extremely unlikely Jones has the money to pay all these damages, though the family's attorneys say they will chase him to the ends of the earth and make him pay every last dollar. Meanwhile, you got Jones's lawyer saying they're going to appeal the verdict, but regardless, this is a huge, huge thing. And the final thing that I want to touch on today, because I saw, I've seen Jones starting the, the beginning of his like kind of like media rounds to try and whitewash this incident. And that's something that might prove very effective because, you know, you, you look back, it's so far away. What did he say? I can't remember. I saw a clip today of him once again being like, I didn't do any of this, which is why I think it's important to showcase some of the shit that he was saying. And in fact, Andrew over at Channel 5 did just that with his Alex Jones interview about two weeks ago. You know, he does this thing where he lets Alex talk and Alex tries to recreate history. And then just in the edit, he plays this. I simply question things and they're trying to demonize me to say questioning things is a bad deal. Uh, and uh, elementary school massacre, 26 dead, 27 dead now, 18 kids in Connecticut. When you got small children, this really gets to you. That's why the globalists use children's deaths to go after our guns, because they know it gets to us. So don't ever think the globalists that have hijacked this country wouldn't stage something like this. They kill little kids all day, every day. And it's not our government, it's the globalist. I really think they're going to try to come after the guns. It's going to start a civil war. I clearly believe from the evidence children are really killed in Sandy Hook, and it's a real tragedy. Unfortunately, evidence is beginning to come out. People who've been coached, people who've been given cue cards, people who are behaving like actors. I dropped Billy off and watched him go around the corner, and he never came back, all because of the guns. Won't you just turn your guns in for my son? I mean, folks, we've got video of Anderson Cooper with clear blue screen out there. Nothing can account for what happens to his nose. Early on, I said, well, they had to have killed somebody. I mean, this doesn't make sense. Then parents come out and start laughing and then turn to the camera and cry. No one died in 2012 in Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook is a synthetic, completely fake, with actors, in my view, manufactured. I couldn't believe it at first. I knew they had actors there, clearly, but I thought they killed some real kids. And it just shows how bold they are. But yeah, ultimately, we're going to have to wait to see how all this happens. And uh, in the meantime, yeah, uh, it appears that Alex Jones is going to be doing the rounds. And it also appeared that he's even trying to fundraise off of this. So that's interesting. And then yeah. holidays have a funny way of sneaking up on you. And if you haven't started preparing for the chaos of holiday mailing and shipping, you're already falling behind. That's why I want to talk about today's sponsor, stamps.com slash Phil. You know, when you're running a small business, every second counts and you can't afford to waste a single moment. Like we're all busy enough as is. And personally, I love how convenient and cost effective this is for me and my business. I can get all the mailing and shipping done without even leaving my house. Plus you can print official US postage from your computer 24 seven, no special supplies or equipment needed. And with inflation on the rise, every single dollar counts. And with stamps.com slash Phil, you get exclusive discounts on post office rates. We're talking like 30% off USPS rates and 86% off UPS rates. Simply put, stamps.com saves me time and money, freeing me up to spend more time to produce this show, make the next drop, spend more time with my family, and just live life. I prefer working to live, not the other way around. So hey, get ahead of the holiday chaos this year and go to stamps.com slash Phil to get a four-week trial plus free postage in a digital scale. There's no risk, no long-term commitments, no contracts, and never go to the post office again. And then here's your tasty, tasty midterm poison. Let me make one of the unsexiest pieces of news, at least consumable because it matters. So right now, based off a of polling from 538, the, the Democrats have a two and three chance of actually holding the Senate, whereas in the House, Republicans have a seven and 10 chance of flipping it. And according to a new poll from CNN, Republicans have a slight edge in the most competitive and closely watched districts. And that's the key thing, in those specific competitive and closely watched districts. Right? Because according to the survey, 48% 
percent of the likely voters in those competitive races, they prefer the Republican candidate while 43% support the Democrat. And in those very close elections, 55% of registered Republicans say they are extremely motivated to head to the polls compared to just 45% of Democrats. I want to point that out because the nationwide polling here can be very misleading. Or when you look at all districts nationwide, it actually looks good for Democrats. With 50% of likely voters saying that they back the Democrat in their district versus 47% who support the Republican. Although, I mean, just on a like a generally disheartening note, four in 10 voters, including more than 60% of independents, they say they don't think the candidate in either party has a clear plan for solving the country's problem. Also something that was very eye-opening is what mattered to voters. Or think in your head right now, what are the, the top three most important things when you're, when you're thinking about who you're voting for? Feel free to pause for a second. And then let's see if it matches up, right? So the survey showed that the economy remains the most important topic for both registered and likely voters. With that, very notably being followed up by voting rights and election integrity, as well as an inflation. It's an incredibly significant thing here is that abortion was actually listed as less important, falling below even gun policies for both demographics and even below immigration for likely voters. And for Democrats and I think pro-choice independents, I think that could also just be uh, having a lack of faith in politicians, right? Not believing that if the Democrats somehow held the House and they had the, the numbers needed to abolish the filibuster in the Senate, that they would actually do it and codify abortion rights. But yeah, ultimately that's the state of things, a little bit of my take. Of course, I'd love to know your thoughts. But these midterms are going to be very interesting to watch. Like I said, if, if you have not already done it, go to headcount.org and make sure you're still registered, come up with a voting plan, be a part of the process. Because in addition to a lot of big lie candidates being on ballots, like uh, there are really concerning reports about how Stop the Steel supporters are training thousands of U.S. poll observers. And some of them are even advising these people to ignore local election rules. But yeah, you either uh, face the challenges of the times or you, you, you turn your back to it and what happens, happens. And then I want to talk about John Fetterman, the Senate candidate out in PA. Side note, thank you to the Eagles offense for keeping me alive this fantasy football season. Just throw it some more to A.J. Brown is all I ask. But I want to talk about Fetterman right now because he's in this extremely tight race with the Wizard of Oz. And uh, the race is kind of based on a few key issues right now. Criminal justice, abortion, inflation, opioids, and Fetterman's health. Right back in May, he suffered a stroke caused by a heart condition. But Fetterman reassured voters that he was on the road toward full recovery, that he had no cognitive damage, and that he would jump right back on the campaign trail after resting. Within the next month, his doctor putting out a letter backing that up and saying, if he does what I've told him, and I do believe that he is taking his recovery and his health very seriously this time, he should be able to campaign and serve in the U.S. Senate without a problem. But his Republican opponents and the captain of Crudite have still attacked his health, criticizing him for not releasing any more medical records since then and not letting journalists interview his physicians. Though Fetterman maintains that if anything changes in his condition, he'll give an update, but until then, it's not necessary. Which now leads us to the big news everyone's talking about his appearance on NBC this week, which was his first sit-down interview since the stroke. And in that, reporter Dasha Burns grills him on whether he's fit to serve in Congress, saying that he seemed to have trouble engaging in small talk before the camera started rolling, with Fetterman explaining that it's an auditory processing issue, which makes it hard to hear what people are saying clearly at times, which is why he had Burns' questions displayed on a computer in real time as captions. But still, you had NBC highlighting this moment where he fumbles a word, kind of kind of really leaning into stuff like this. I always thought I was pretty empathetic, uh, uh, emphatic. Uh, I, was, I think I was very, excuse me, empathetic. Uh, you know, that's an example of the stroke, empathetic. Yeah. I, I always thought I was very empathetic uh, before having a stroke. But now after having that stroke, I really understand you know, much more kind of the challenges that Americans have day in and day out. Which I just have to say as a side note, if if you think that is bad, you should hear all the fucking flubbed lines that get cut out of this show every day. Also with this, you had Fetterman supporters saying, hey, I'd rather have Fetterman kind of flubbing something here or there rather than fucking Dr. Oz, the quack who promoted miracle cures to millions of credulous housewives for years. Also Fetterman himself stressing the difference between him and Oz throwing out this jab. Dr. Oz likes to make fun of me that I might miss a word, but you know, he's missed, you know, two words. And that is a yes or no on the national abortion uh, ban. But still, with all this, you had Republicans holding up that interview as evidence that Fetterman's cognitive issues preclude him from serving. That then prompting pushback from disability advocates and others who spoke to him. Like one New York mag reporter who interviewed Fetterman tweeting that his comprehension is not at all impaired. He understands everything. It's just that he reads it and responds in real time, saying it's a hearing and auditory challenge. Others also calling the attacks on him ableist and saying this is just one instance of a bigger pattern of discrimination in politics. And actually with this, and I've only really recently learned this, for people with business physical disabilities like this, this kind of prejudice against them is more prevalent than you'd think. I have a guy on my team, for example, who actually worked with me on this story and he offered up the opportunity to say, you know, 
He is blind and people sometimes assume that that means he's incompetent. Whereas in reality, that's the furthest thing from the truth. He's one of the best people I've ever worked with. And for people with speech pathologies in particular, that experience can be especially frustrating. Where you have people seeing a communication issues as questionable intelligence or cognitive decline. But even though it's been said that Fetterman is expected to get better and better and he's using this technology kind of just in the interim as like a, a walking cane to, to, to fully get his stride back. It hasn't stopped Republicans from asserting that he's unfit for office and also doing so in the fucking most disgusting ways. If you don't remember a senior communication advisor to Dr. Oz's campaign said, quote, if John Fetterman had ever eaten a vegetable in his life, then maybe he wouldn't have had a major stroke, which I just see as a further confirmation with Oz and in general that you are who you keep around you. And then I watched the final January 6th hearing so you didn't have to, though I will link to it down below because you should. It started with a committee saying some notable things. The most striking fact is that all this evidence come almost entirely from Republicans. A key lesson of this investigation is this. Our institutions only hold when men and women of good faith make them hold, regardless of the political cost. We have no guarantee that these men and women will be in place next time. President Trump knew from unassailable sources that his election fraud claims were false. He admitted he had lost the election. He took actions consistent with that belief. With Chairman Benny Thompson specifically clarifying that this session was not a hearing, but rather a committee business meeting, but that the panel will still present new evidence. While much of the evidence reinforces what we already knew, there were a few interesting findings here. Right, specifically regarding Trump's efforts to overturn the election being premeditated. They went through testimony and documents outlining how many close to Trump encouraged him to embrace lies about mail-in voting ahead of the election. Also playing lots of new testimonies from some of the president's top advisors and senior administration officials who outlined how Trump knew that he had lost the election. This including from aides who said he explicitly acknowledged that he had lost in private conversations, as well as from others who said he had made the acknowledgement implicitly through actions like ordering overseas military withdrawals implicating he was trying to accomplish final military goals. One of the key and most notable pieces of new information came from the members' efforts to present the potential for violence and how well known it was. With one of the most prominent moments of the hearing being the clip of Trump advisor Roger Stone. I suspect it'll be, I really do suspect it will still be up in the air. But when that happens, the key thing to do is to claim victory. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. No, we won. Fuck you. Sorry. Over. We won. Yeah. Yep. You're wrong. Fuck you. ABC. <laughs> I said fuck the Lord and let's get right to the violence. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Members also introduced a lot of new evidence from Secret Service memos that show that the agency was well aware of the potential for violence. This including communications from December that showed the Secret Service was informed that extremist groups, specifically the Proud Boys, planned to march into D.C. armed on January 6th with a source explicitly saying their plan is to literally kill people. Please, please take this tip seriously and investigate further. Other texts and emails further showed that Secret Service agents arrested several Trump supporters carrying assault rifles and pistols in D.C. on January 6th. And members specifically claiming that Trump himself knew the crowd of his supporters were armed and dangerous and heading to the Capitol, and saying that Trump and the White House had ample opportunity to try and stop this. The committee then went on to outline how Trump refused to call off the mob, presenting testimonies to establish how Trump for hours refused demands from top advisors and the closest to him to stop the deadly violence as he watched it unfold. The panel then playing previously unseen footage of both the Democratic and Republican congressional leaders where they're pleading with the Trump administration to provide resources and help the people in the Capitol. And remember, for the sake of time, I'm trying to condense this, make it consumer but I can't hit on everything, so I definitely recommend you, you click the link down below and watch it, even if it's on like 1.75x speed. But the last thing that I want to mention with this is what happened at the very end, and that is the fact that the committee closed this session by voting unanimously to subpoena Trump to testify. Now, as far as what happens next, I mean, we're going to have to wait to see the inevitable legal battle over this unprecedented subpoena. But if one thing is clear is that the panel's work is not yet done, and not just on this front, right? Because in her closing remarks, Liz Cheney literally said that the panel has information to consider criminal referrals for multiple individuals. So some big things to keep an eye on. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. Thank you for watching and subscribing to my daily dives into the news here. If you're looking for more news, I got you with more Philip DeFranco show here or this brand new channel that's been blowing up for us where I just cover international news. But do what you will because my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.